Very warm welcome also from my side. Um, my name is Tobias Wieland. I have the pleasure to chair and host our first session of, the day, of today. It's my honor to introduce Karen Eng for uh, kicking off the second day of our conference. Uh, Karen Eng is professor of philosophy at El Thunderbolt University and specializes in European philosophy, especially focusing on, uh, broadly speaking, Frankfurt critical theory and social and political questions and also feminist philosophy. Um, in her latest book, uh, Hegel's Concept of Life, Self-Consciousness, Freedom and Logic, uh, she kind of carries out, I'd say, um, the very idea of uh, species consciousness and purposiveness from Kant to Hegel and carries out that thought in the science of logics. And I think today it's kind of a further carrying out this over to Marx. So please join me in welcoming Karen and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Toby, and um, thank you so much to all the organizers, to Thomas, uh, Alexi, Isabel, Emily, Jonathan, for, for organizing this really awesome event. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Okay, so I have a PowerPoint, <laughs> um, but we can sort of just treat it mostly like a handout. So my very broad aim today is to reconsider the concept of species being by approaching it not as a question primarily about human essence, but as an orienting normative framework of Marx's critical project, where I take that project to be broadly continuous with the Kantian and post-Kantian conception of critique. Um, and we heard a little bit about um, how we might think about the continuities between Kant and Marx in uh, Le Yipi's talk last night, uh, which was really exciting. <laughs> So in what can be considered in one of Marx's earliest attempts to spell out the general project of a critique of political economy, which initially moved between a critique of religion and a critique of the political state, Marx draws on several features of Kant's notion of critique and adopts them for his own purposes. So first is this idea of a Copernican revolution in philosophy, which Marx interprets in humanist terms writing that human beings revolve around themselves as their real son, and that human beings are the root, origin, and source of their own activity. Um, Marx's Copernican revolution places human self-determination at the center of social criticism, such that societies made through human activity can be remade through that same activity. Second, and in, a, in an explicitly moral register, Kant rewrites, uh, sorry, Marx rewrites uh, Kant's categorical imperative as the demand to, quote, overthrow all circumstances in which man is humiliated, enslaved, abandoned, and despised. For Marx, this new categorical imperative follows from the doctrine that man is the highest being for man, taking an ardent stance against all forms of theodistical thinking that would justify human suffering on theological, historical, political, or naturalist grounds. Finally, um, echoing Kant's enlightenment call to have the courage to use our own understanding, Marx writes that we need courage in order to become conscious of the oppression that results from our social organization and to publicize this consciousness, teaching the people to be shocked by themselves. So I think in at least these three ways, we can see Marx's critical project as radicalizing Kant's conception of critique by placing human species being rather than pure self-consciousness at the center of his analysis. So my narrower and sort of more specific aim today is to try to consider how a concept of species being contributes to Marx's understanding of the metabolic interaction between human beings and nature and how an, an idea or a concept of natural limits might figure into that story. So although the idea of natural limits might appear to be inimical, to the humanist strands of Marx's project that I sketched above, I hope to show that this is not the case. Um, rather, when conceived correctly, limits can be understood as conditions that at once enable and constrain the metabolic activities of human beings and the metabolic activity of living beings more broadly. To avoid a Malthusian approach to nat natural limits, where such limits operate basically in the manner of an ahistorical or fixed law of nature, I will try to sketch an account of natural limits in connection with a number of ideas in Hegel and Aristotle. So um, 
for, for Aristotle, limits are determined in accordance with the purpose of the activity or thing in question. So a lack of limits actually for Aristotle suggests a lack of purpose. Um, and natural limits for Aristotle are not defined in contrast either with historically or socially imposed limits, but are simply understood as limits that are defined in accordance with particular purposes and aims. For Hegel, limits are treated unsurprisingly dialectically, determining both what something is and what something is not. Um, and although we, you know, we might suspect that Hegel is being a bit uh, obscurantist here with his uh, formulation, I think his account is actually very helpful. And he develops this account of limits in connection with his account of determination and qualitative being as negation, where something constitution is in part determined by standing in relations with what it is not. So I'm going to try to argue that by, by combining these two approaches, um, we can come to an understanding of Marx's account of natural limits, um, which for living beings are determined in relation to their species concept. In the human case, natural limits can be understood in relation to self-conscious species being. Um, but although self-consciousness introduces, obviously, a lot of uh, further considerations and complications, I don't think this entirely annuls the idea of natural limits, without which, um, I argue, we cannot really make sense of Marx's critique of capital as the limitless process of self-valorization. So although the, and of course, the critique of capital's limitlessness is not the only feature of Marx's analysis, but I do take it to be a central node that connects many key issues, including capital's fundamental irrationality as an institutionalized social order, along with its deleterious effects on human beings and the ecological systems on which they depend. So <clears throat> I'm, the paper is gonna have two parts. The first part, I'm gonna try to sketch this idea of species being from Hegel to Marx, um, um, sort of uh, doing the thing that we were told yesterday maybe we shouldn't do. Um, and one of the things that comes out in that account is this, uh, the importance of this idea that species being is connected to the, as this idea of measure, an inherent measure. Um, and then in the second section, I'm going to talk about natural limits, talk about this passage from Capital where, talk, where Marx talks about the limitlessness of capital um, and connect it to some themes in Aristotle and Hegel. <clears throat> okay, so the first section is species being and Marx's humanist project of critique. So although there's no doubt that Marx's immediate context of intellectual engagement suggests, su suggests Feuerbach as the source of the term Gattungswesen, it is Hegel who first develops a systematic account of the intimate connection between self-consciousness and species consciousness that lies at the core of the concept. Without underestimating the vast differences between Kant and his German idealist successors, um, we could say that one distinguishing feature of what has become known as critical as opposed to dogmatic philosophy in this tradition concerns the inescapable role of self-consciousness in articulating its own conditions. So whereas Kant was primarily interested in the transcendental conditions of uh, both pure theoretical and practical reason, whose ultimate source was the unity of pure self-consciousness, Post-Kantian thinkers became increasingly attuned to understanding the conditions of knowing and agency in relation to both nature and historically developing social relations and institutions. In articulating these natural and historical conditions, however, self-consciousness continued to play a central role via what uh, I'm gonna call the reflexivity condition. So the reflexivity condition um, uh, is, this is how I'm going to define it. Um, it states that our philosophical accounts of nature and history, along with their interrelation, must be able to account for the self-conscious activity of coming to grasp nature and history as conditions of human knowledge and action. So in the case of nature, our philosophical accounts must conceive of nature in, the way, in a way that makes it intelligible that self-conscious life can emerge through natural processes. So yesterday we had this great conversation early on in the day about why um, uh, we can't have a mechanical um, account of nature. And so the, 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 the whole debate within post-Kantian philosophy stretching into, into Marx um, that why is it that nature can't be universal mechanism? I think one of the reasons is what I'm trying to articulate here in terms of the reflexivity condition. In the case of history, which we also discussed yesterday, our philosophical accounts must conceive of history such that its processes can be grasped as the results of self-determining actions of social individuals and groups. So whatever historical materialism is, it should not be thought of in terms of economic or technological determinism. 
Critical philosophy um, subscribes to the reflexivity condi condition, I I, I'm arguing here, which secures the role of self-consciousness in its very method. Dogmatic philosophy, which is generally in associated with spinicism and religious dogma in the context here, ignores or obscures the role of self-conscious thought and agency in the presentation of its subject matter. So whether in claiming that everything is substance or that God created the best of all possible worlds, dogmatic philosophy obscures the role of self-conscious agency in coming to know and act upon its own conditions. So I start here with this idea of a, the reflexivity condition because it sets the stage for uh, two claims that I hope to develop in what follows. The first is the importance um, of self-consciousness, which I'm going to suggest that Marx understands in terms of species being. And the importance of this idea, I think, lies not simply in its character characterization of what might be distinct or even essential about human beings, but in its role as a methodological and ultimately normative orientation of Marx's critical project. So this means that although Marx famously comes to pretty much abandon the language of species being, I think that there's no evidence that Marx ever abandons the importance of self-consciousness or of the reflexivity condition, which opens up a new way of thinking about how species being could provide the framework for a critique of political economy. Second, any account of natural limits, uh, which I'll try to develop in the second section of my paper, will be subject to the reflexivity condition. That is, if there are natural limits and if human activity is subject to such limits, these must be conceived in relation to our power of self-conscious agency rather than as fixed or insurpassable element, uh, impediments. So as I just mentioned, the idea of self-consciousness as species being, uh, I think, is first developed by Hegel. In the Phenomenology of Spirit and many other places, Hegel claims that self-consciousness is the Gattung for itself. And he conceives of the self-active, self-relation of the I as a form of living activity that grasps its own universal form. So we can understand um, Hegel's claim that self-consciousness is species consciousness through three interconnected arguments. So first, it, since self-consciousness is characterized as the self-relation of the I, I think Hegel is simply applying a principle that for him holds for the determination of all individuals, namely that individuals are what they are on account of being an individual of a particular species or kind. So an individual is never simply a this, but always a this such. And so an individual I can be determined as such only by being an I of a particular kind. If self-consciousness is an awareness of oneself as an individual I, then it follows that self-consciousness must always also involve and at least partially consist in species consciousness. So that means that to be, to grasp, and posit oneself as an I, which is such an important, like what that means is such an important philosophical question for this tradition. Um, I think that the idea of species being suggests that grasping, positing, uh, uh, under, grasping oneself as an I is to posit, grasp uh, oneself as an I that instantiates a species. So Hegel, uh, so whereas Hegel describes the self-relation in terms of being a gatum for itself, Marx describes self-consciousness as species being insofar as it consists in, quote, making his own species into his object. In another formulation from the 44 manuscripts that affirms this Hegelian understanding of the intimate necessary connection between individuals and the universal species concepts they instantiate, Marx states simply that the individual is the social being. So, what is important here is that grasping oneself as a species being is neither opposed to nor in any way obscures the individuality of the I. Rather, to be an I is to be a species being aware of oneself as both individual and universal at once. So second, self-consciousness to species consciousness follows from a particular understanding of life and the fundamental shape of its activity. In all of his major discussions of the topic, Hegel's enter, Hegel enters into the problem of self-consciousness through a discussion of life, arriving at the conclusion that self-consciousness is a form of living activity that grasps its own living form. Beginning with life is one of the ways in which the reflexivity condition is met if we wish to proceed from a broadly naturalistic perspective in which self-consciousness and its activities emerge from and are conditioned by the natural world. Natural processes must manifest a form of activity that is continuous with the activities of self-consciousness, express, expressing a potentiality for both intelligence and self-determination that can be realized in myriad forms. 
Although this naturalistic and perhaps even materialistic perspective is usually associated with Marx rather than Hegel, I think it is in fact Hegel who first provides a, an account of exactly how, as Marx says in the German ideology, quote, life determines consciousness. So in what specific determinant ways does it matter that self-consciousness is self-conscious life? So I think in the conclusion of the of all places of the science of logic, Hegel actually tries to attempt to answer this question by outlining three fundamental processes characteristic of living activity that are presupposed by self-conscious cognition. So the first concerns corporeality. Living activity is realized in a determinate body, which at once enables and constrains possibilities of knowing and action. Self-consciousness then is first of all an awareness of one's living body of its powers, of its limits, of its boundaries, and of its needs. The second concerns a relation to an external environment. Since living beings can only sustain and reproduce themselves by being open to and assimilating materials from the environment. Hegel refers to this uh, presupposition of self-consciousness as a conformable externality, but I think his account of living processes and exchanges in relation to external nature comes very close to Marx's concept of metabolism. So in describing the form of the labor process, Marx writes that, quote, the metabolic interaction, Stoffwechsel, between man and nature is an everlasting nature-imposed condition of human existence. But more broadly, we can say that the metabolic interaction between living beings and nature is the everlasting nature-imposed condition of all life. And in, in capital three, Marx says that. He says that metabolism is prescribed by the natural laws of life itself. So, Self-consciousness then is thus, secondly, consciousness of our relationship with and dependence upon exchanges and interactions with nature. You could say it's a sort of self-conscious metabolism, self-conscious metabolic activity. Um, the third process presupposed by self-consciousness outlined by Hegel are those of the Gattung itself. Living beings are embodied creatures that sustain and reproduce themselves through exchanges with an environment, but the specific shape of this embodied activity is determined through participation in the broader life of a species or life form. As discussed above, individuals are always individuals of a particular kind, instantiating the life of a species. So individuals not only reproduce their own kind and propagate their species through interactions among members, but perhaps more importantly, it is species membership and participation that gives a specific and determinate shape to all of its activities, providing a standard for functioning and well-being. So self-consciousness then is third and finally, consciousness of one species life, or more directly, it is species consciousness. When Marx claims that, quote, it is self, -con sorry, when Marx claims that it is, quote, conscious life activity alone that makes the human being a species being, we can understand conscious life activity to consist minimally in the consciousness of these three fundamental life processes, processes that will at once enable and constrain the activities of self-consciousness. Okay, so the third and final feature, and this is the one that's going to help us transition to the next section, um, Species being for Marx um, and it entails certain theoretical and practical powers. Um, Hegel gives a sort of very complicated version of this argument, I think, also in the logic, but it, Marx actually is much more clear and succinct about this. So he writes concerning um, the theoretical and practical powers of species being as follows. We've sort of seen these quotes already, but I'll just read them uh, quickly because I think they are important here. So man is a species being not only in that practically and theoretically, he makes his own and other species into his objects. But also, and this is only another way of putting the same thing, he relates to himself as the present living species um, in that he relates to himself as a universal and therefore free, free being. I think so much is packed into that quote, right? There's a claim there about self-consciousness. There's a claim about what the powers of self-consciousness understood as species consciousness, um, what the theoretical and practical powers of self-consciousness as species consciousness entails. So that's like a really dense passage. So he continues and he sort of elaborates on this key line of uh, what does it mean to make his own and other species into his objects? So he writes, the animal only fashions things according to the standards and needs of the species it belongs to, whereas man knows how to produce according to the measure of every species, nac demas jedes vecies, and knows everywhere how to apply its inherent standard, inherent mass, to the object. Thus, man also fashions things according to the laws of beauty. Um, I'm going to say a lot more about this idea of mass moving on um, in the paper. So 
The key power um, afforded by species being concerns the power to make his own and other species into his objects. The self-conscious capacity to grasp our own species concept is thus essentially connected with the power and capacity to employ species concepts more generally, a capacity that transforms how we relate to, to nature from both a theoretical and practical perspective. So theoretically speaking, species being affords an intellectual power of knowing the quote, inherent standard or inherent mass of things such that scientific and aesthetic engagement with the natural world becomes possible. And we heard a lot about this um, in Sabina's talk uh, yesterday about the, the, the way in which um, Marx has this whole story to tell about our aesthetic engagement with the world. The theoretical power to think and judge in accordance with species concepts is at the same time a practical power that allows us to produce according to the measure or mass of every species. It is uh, in this, quote, working over or bearbeitung of the, of the objective world that man first really affirms himself as a species being. So I just want to make a note here. In describing the theoretical practical powers of species being, Marx is clearly not suggesting that they allow us to know and act as universal and free beings insofar as we can transcend or overcome the conditions of life or the limitations set by nature. Instead, the conceptual and productive abilities of self-consciousness insofar as they are rational, lie in knowing and producing in accordance with the objective and inherent standards of the species of things, our own as much as those of the myriad of things around us that make up an entire natural world. So the universal freedom afforded by self-consciousness is not to know and produce in whatever manner it likes or chooses, nor even simply to do so only in accordance with our own species, but to know and produce in accordance with the measure of every species, which provides an objective standard for both theory and praxis. So insofar as the concept of species being revolves around a particular understanding of self-consciousness and its powers, I think there's ample evidence to suggest that this idea really continues to play a central role in Marxist philosophy well beyond his early works, from the development of a materialist conception of history to the fundamental account of the labor process and capital volume one. So clearly I'm opposing my view to the, to the epistemological break view. <laughs> Marx's critique of political economy from the early critique of alienated labor to the mature account of the th in the three volumes of capital revolves around the idea that there is this that revolves around the self-conscious character of human productive activity which is enabled and constrained by certain conditions of life and alienated or distorted to the extent that it is organized around the limitless pursuit of surplus value rather than species being so with this idea of species being in view i'm going to now in the next section i'm going to turn to this problem of natural limits um, as I hope to show, the idea of natural limits is both central for Marx's critique of capital and also fully compatible with, these humanist, uh, with this humanist orientation of his project that I just sketched um, in this first section. So the second section is on natural limits. So one of the key features of Marx's critique of capital concerns its movement as a form of limitless self-valorization. In developing the general formula for, uh, for capital, Marx describes this movement in which value presents itself as a subject, as self-moving substance, right? All of these really fanciful and kind of beautiful descriptions. It lays golden eggs um, and, and, it, 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 and so on and so forth. But I think the problem here is not simply this inversion, right? So that's another way to read this. A uh, very common way that there's an inversion going on where capital is the living subject with agency and a clear purpose and human beings are sort of reduced to, to a mere commodity and thing. Rather, I think the problem concerns here, there's another way of reading Marx's critique here, where the pro problem concerns a relation between ends and limits, which Marx presents as follows. So this quote, uh, I'm going to read this quote here. This, in a way, the rest of the paper is a, a, a me trying to unpack and understand this quote. So. Marx says, the simple circulation of commodities, selling in order to buy, is a means towards a final goal or endsweck, which lies outside circulation, namely the appropriation of use values, the satisfaction of needs. As against this, the circulation of money as capital is an end in itself, a zelpsweck, for the valorization of value takes place only within this constantly renewed movement. The movement of capital is therefore limitless or maslos. So what exactly with, is the problem with the limitless uh, movement of capital as a zelpsweck that continually adds value to itself? 
From a certain ecological perspective, the answer is clear. Insofar as the natural resources of the earth are themselves a source of value and a necessary condition for the labor for the human labor process that produces value, these natural resources are obviously not limitless, and capital's limitless movement threatens to destroy the earthly conditions of its self-valorization. Um, two very prominent theories, well known in this room, I'm sure, um, have defended this perspective in different ways. So we've got the metabolic rift theory. Um, Thomas sort of described this a little bit in his introduction. Um, Foster and Bur Burkett basically argue that capitalism produces an irreparable rift in the metabolic relation between human beings and the earth. Um, so uh, I, I won't read this whole passage here, but from this idea of a metabolic rift, Foster argues that we can find in Marx's critique of capitalism a deep interest in sustainability, um, where ecological sustainability is crucial for addressing the problems of alienation. We have a, a theory uh, in Nancy Fraser, who she's emphasized the need to expand our conception of capitalism um, beyond production and understand it as an institutionalized social order. And her version is a crisis theory approach to capitalism's ecological contradiction. She argues that given that nature functions as a sort of non-economic condition of possibility for production and exchange, um, she argues that capitalism is structurally prone to ecological crisis since it is primed to free ride on a nature that really cannot self-replenish without limit, um, which means that capitalism's economy is always on the verge of destabilizing its own conditions of possibility. So I think these two critical frameworks offer very important insights, both as readings of Marx and as approaches for de developing ecological critiques of capitalism, but I'm gonna try to take a slightly different approach um, and returning to the passage I quoted just now, um, I want to just think differently about why it's a problem for Marx that the movement and aim of capital is limitless or Maslow's. Um, I wanna argue that there is a philosophical conception of natural limits. So I think the Bur Burkitt and Fraser are basically right, uh, but I think that con concept of limit is based, it's an empirical concept of limit, right? The, the earth's resources are as a matter of empirical fact. <laughs> It, the earth is not limitless, and so this creates all kinds of problems. But I think that there's also a philosophical and even normative conceptual of natural limits at work in Marx's critique. Um, and one I'm gonna try to show is compatible with the reflexivity condition and the account of species being that I presented in the first section. Um, a further note is that in developing this account of natural limits, I'm not going back to the first generation of ecological Marxism, for example, in the work of Ted Benton, um, who, who in fact criticized Marx on account of not attending to natural limits. So he, the Promethean Marx, right, ignored natural limits. So that was actually a critique of the first generation of eco-Marxists. Um, and that debate really concerned whether we understood natural limits in an ahistorical Malthusian fashion or rather, rather or, or whether they were instead subject to social and historical specification, specification and determination. I'm gonna take for granted that Marx's account is always, and, right, everything is Marx is going to be historically variable. Um, so I'm not gonna get into that debate here. Um, uh, so I'm gonna take, take for granted that natural limits can only be grasped in relation to the self-conscious metabolic interactions between humans and nature. Um, and so instead of going back to the first generation, I'm just gonna, raise two philosophical questions moving on, which will lead me to Aristotle um, and then eventually back to Hegel. So the first question is, what does it mean? What does it mean really to say that capital is Maslow's? Especially when we want to think about that idea of that, that it's Maslow's, not just in, um, in, in a merely empirical sense. And then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Marx's really, really long footnote that I'm sure you're all familiar with, where he cites Aristotle's politics at length in order to try to explain this problem. So. <clears throat> What, what makes the capital, the movement of capital in contrast to the simple circulation of commodities limitless? Um, in order to distinguish between money as money and money as capital, right, he famously distinguishes between these two forms of circulation. Simple circulation, where there is a transformation of commodities into money, and then we turn that back, money back into commodities. Um, and then there's a second form of circulation where there, there is a transformation of money into commodities and the reconversion of commodities into money. Only the second form is the circulation of money as capital. And as Marx suggests, this form of circulation would be completely empty, absurd, pointless, purposeless, <laughs> if the amount of money at the two extremes turned out to be the same. So of course, the point is to for the original sum of money to increase or the creation of surplus value. So it is this process of, of valorization, this increase in the magnitude of value through the process of circulation 
This is the movement of capital, and it is this process that Marx is referring to as Maslow's. We can identify at least two senses of limitlessness here. The first is its sheer endlessness. The movement of capital is endless, or Marx uses also the term endlos, in being infinite and never ending. For money, insofar as it circulates as capital, has a, a vocation or beruf for infinite self-valorization. Here, the uh, movement of capital has no endpoint because it is quantitatively endless. The second sense of capital's limitlessness concerns its lack of genuine measure or standard, mass. The implication here is that mere quantitative increase does not suffice to provide a measure through which we can determine something like a meaningful determinate aim. Thus, although the self-valorizing movement of capital appears as a Zelpsbeck, this appearance is ultimately false, for it actually lacks any qualitative measure or standard through which a proper end or goal can be determined in the first place. So as I suggested, most accounts basically focus on this first sense of capital's limitlessness. Um, and I, I'm not going to dispute it. I think it's pretty much correct. Um, but I'm going to focus on the second sense of capital's limitlessness, this idea that it doesn't have a proper standard uh, or measure or mass. So recall that Marx um, had earlier specified that one of the key powers afforded by species being concern the ability to know and produce according to the inherent measure or inherent mass of things, insofar as we make our own species and the species of other things into our objects. In connecting the idea of inherent measure with the idea of species being, Marx is drawing directly from Hegel's account of uh, conceptual unity and objectivity, which is modeled on the organic unity of individuals and their actuality as instantiations or exemplars of their species. Although, of course, not everything in nature is an organic individual or has a biological species concept, it is only through the cognitive and practical powers of living beings and species beings that objective inherent standards can be grasped and employed as part of theoretical and practical projects. This connection between conceptual objectivity or inherent measure and species being reveals that naturalism and critical idealism are inseparable for Hegel and Marx, something we've also heard a lot about yesterday. Um, so he, indeed, Hegel writes in The Logic that the opposition of idealistic and realistic philosophy has no significance. And the early Marx writes um, of the accomplished naturalism of man and the accomplished humani humanism of nature. So knowing and acting in accord with the inherent measure of things is possible because we ourselves are a manifestation of such a measure, both as living beings and as species beings. Um, the limitlessness of capital, then, in the sense of being without a genuine measure or standard, refers to its being entirely untethered to the needs and aims of species being, to the self-conscious and self-determining activities of living beings whose theoretical and practical projects have the power to operate in accord with the inherent measure of things. So I think this is one important way of um, conceiving of natural limits as inherently connected with both living beings and species beings who provide their own measure for their activities. So when Marx claims that capital is Maslow's, one of the key problems concerns its disconnection from and ultimately its thwarting of the needs and aims of living beings and species beings as bearers and agents of their own inherent standards. Okay. So Marx provides, now we're going to get into the Aristotle. <laughs> Marx provides some, uh, a little bit more context for his claim that capital is limitless in the sense of being without a proper measure in a footnote that cites Aristotle's politics at length on this distinction between the two forms of the art of acquisition. Um, the, the one for the, so the first form for Aristotle, he calls it, it's a natural part of household management or, or, or economia in pursuit of true wealth, which is necessarily limited and subject to definite bounds, Aristotle says. The second one he associates with exchange and retail trade, operating on the assumption that the pursuit of wealth and property is unlimited, subject to no bounds. In articulating this distinction, Aristotle additionally presents the distinction between use value and exchange value, which roughly tracks the value horizon and purposes of the respective arts of acquisition. The movement of capital is clearly tracking the second sense um, of the art of acquisition, and I take it that Marx's very, very, very long reference to Aristotle here is a signal that um, Aristotle's account of limits um, can, at least in part, help to explain this problem of capital's limitlessness.
So uh, I'm going to try to think about two issues, two questions that uh, in in this uh, Arist Aristotelian distinction that I think are helpful for understanding Marx. The first is this uh, very obviously contested, impossible to settle term natural. So what is natural about natural limits? What is natural about this natural form of acquisition that pursues true wealth, which is necessarily limited and bounded? And then the second question is uh, the second question concerns this connection that Aristotle draws between limits and pur limits on the one hand and purposes and aims on the other. Okay, so what is natural then about natural limits? For Aristotle's and and many other philosophers following him, the key distinction is between the natural and the artificial. So that's how we mark the distinction. Um, and Aristotle explains this distinction as follows. He says, "Quote." For a thing, sorry, I don't have this is from the metaphysics. For a thing is generated either by art or by nature. Art is the principle in the thing other than that which is generated. Nature is a principle in the thing itself. So nature is a, is a principle in the thing itself. For Aristotle, what is natural is what contains a principle, we can say the source of its own generation and production, what contains the source of its own activity. It is self-producing and self-organizing, or in the words of Kant and Hegel, we can say that what is natural is a Zelbsweck. That that which is artificial has its principle or source of production and generation outside itself. Its principle of activity uh, comes from something outside. Its purpose is externally determined from elsewhere. So when Aristotle suggests that there is a natural form of the art of acquisition that pursues true wealth, and that this process is subject to natural limits or bounds, what he means is that this process provides its own principle of activity and is the source of its own rules for production and generation. The natural form of acquisition is also natural in a more straightforward sense. He says it's given by nature to all living beings from the moment when they are first born to the days when their growth is finished. The natural limits of this natural form of acquisition are set by the life form itself, which in our case is to, quote, ensure the availability of a supply of objects which are capable of being stored and are either necessary for life or useful to the association of the polis or the household. These are the objects which may be regarded as constituting true wealth for the amount of whole household property which suffices for a good life is not unlimited. Instead, there is a bound fixed, as is also the case in the means required by the other arts. So the natural form of the art of, art of acquisition has limits that are self-determined in two ways. First, by the needs of the life form's own activity. And second, in accordance with usefulness, where insofar as what is useful are mere means, they are by definition limited. So this is, brings us to the second way um, that Aristotle is going to understand natural limits, which is connected to his understanding of usefulness and the setting of proper ends. Aristotle explains the second unlimited form of the art of acquisition by introducing the by now very well-known distinction between use value and exchange value. And it is through the development of the art of exchange, uh, what he eventually calls retail trade, that the acquisition of property acquires its unlimited character. What provides something with a natural limit, as opposed to being unlimited or boundless, concerns a relationship between means and purposes or ends. So, He's sort of reflecting here on this relationship between means and ends. Um, he attempts to explain the problem by comparing the art, and this is the last passage from Aristotle, he, uh, ex explain this problem by comparing the art of acquisition with different kinds of arts, right? Com he does this all the time. It's all, Aristotle does this all the time. Um, there are different arts that also employ means towards ends. So he says, the wealth produced by this second form of the art of acquisition is unlimited. The art of medicine recognizes no limit in respect to the production of health, and the arts generally admit no limit in respect to the production of their ends, each seeking to produce its end to the greatest possible extent. Though medicine and the arts generally recognize and practice a limit to the means they use to attain their ends, since the end itself constitute, constitutes a limit. And so this is, I think, the key line here, where he's trying to draw this connection between ends or purposes and limits. Um, the art of household management, as distinct from the art of acquisition, has a limit. The object of that art is not an unlimited amount of wealth. OK, so this passage, it is admittedly a bit confusing, but what I'm going to try to draw pull from it are basically two different kind, two senses of limit. So first, the art of medicine has no limit in, this, in the sense that it attempts to produce health to the greatest possible extent 
But the greatest possible extent here has to be both quantitative and qualitative. Um, so we could say both for the greatest number of people and the highest degree suitable for living a good life. But I want to add here that when Aristotle, that the unlimited nature of the greatest possible extent has to be irreducibly qualitative. I think this is the problem here, right? That the limitlessness of capital is, is a sort of purely quantitative determination, and Aristotle is showing that limits require the determination of a determinate aim or purpose. Um, the, the means employed in all arts, Aristotle says, is limited, and so I think this brings us to the second sense of limit, which is defined explicitly in, re in relation to this idea of an end or purpose or a telos. When Aristotle claims that there is a limit to the means we use to attain ends, it is because the end itself constitutes a limit. So although the art of medicine uh, seeks to produce wealth to the greatest possible extent, it remains limited in a different sense, insofar as it is tied to a determinate, qualitatively defined purpose. The purpose itself constitutes a limit because it sets qualitative boundaries without which um, we would not be able to ascertain the appropriate means towards it. So the, the upshot here, I think, is that natural limits are determined by determinate, irreducibly qualitative purposes and aims. The natural form of the art of acquisition is limited because it has the determinate aim of subsistence or living well. The second form of acquisition is unlimited because it has no determinate aim or purpose at all. Mere quantitative increase is not a properly defined purpose that can set any limits with respect to means, thereby distorting the very idea of rationally employing means towards ends. Without being subject to natural limits, in the sense here outlined, um, being self-determined in accordance with activities and purposes of living beings, capital is maslow's because it does not constitute a proper purpose or aim at all. And I think one of the things that Marx might be suggesting here um, sort of going even further than, than the first generation of the Frankfurt School, it's not that capital is a form of instrumental reason. I think he's saying that capital in being without any natural limit or quantitative determinateness is not even instrumentally rational because the very idea of employing means towards ends of instrumental rationality itself requires this concept of natural limits. Okay, so that's, I'm gonna try to, I, I don't have much time left. Um, I'm gonna very quickly just try to say a couple of things about Hegel. Basically what Hegel does um, is that we can, Hegel can help us um, develop this Aristotelian account of limits in a more dialectical fashion. Um, he sort of allows us to block the worry that this Aristotelian account is maybe overly fixed or ahistorical um, when we're thinking about this problem of natural limits and er, uh, Hegel basically gives us a kind of dynamic approach. Um, to limits as enabling conditions. So um, very quickly, Hegel takes up the problem of limits in connection with this very broad question of thinking about the determinateness of being as such, right? So what makes something determinate? Um, how, what gives something a quality? How should we understand qualitative determinateness at all? At a very, very high altitude, determinateness for Hegel unsurprisingly involves negation. What something is, insofar as it has determinate qualities, is determined in relation to what it is not. Great, perfect Hegelian uh, claim. We can say further that anything that has a qualitative determinateness has a particular constitution and likewise a limit. So Hegel writes, through the limit, something is what it is, and in the limit, it has its quality. I think this accords very well with what we've seen in Aristotle's account where qualitative determinateness requires limits. Capital is limitless in part because it has no qualitative determination, only a quantitative one. So Hegel says two further things uh, that makes his account of limits, I think, more explicitly dynamic and dialectical than Aristotle. So first he says that something in its limit both is and is not. And secondly, he says that since the limit is in the determination itself, as a limitation, something transcends its own self. Gate et ras damit über sich self hinaus. Okay, so very quickly, I'm gonna draw two conclusions from this and then I'll be done. <laughs> so the first, um, in suggesting that something in its limit both is and is not, Hegel is introducing the idea that limits can be understood not as inert fixed points, but as enabling conditions of possibility possibility that makes something what it is, that define, as he would say, its constitution. Limits constrain what something is and what something can be and what it cannot be, but they also represent something's fundamental enabling conditions that are the source of its possibilities, powers, and capacities. 
That is to say, without such limits, nothing would be constituted such that it had powers, possibilities, and capacities at all. Limits enable, as empower, limits enable and empower as much as they constrain, and they do so both at once to provide things with a determinate constitution such that they can be what they can be, and when applicable, do what they can do. Okay, so second, um, and elaborating on, this, elaborating on this idea of limits as conditions that enable and constrain, Hegel, Hegel claims that it is through limitations that something can transcend or go beyond its own self. This further emphasizes, I think, the dynamic power contained in limits that I want to stress. Um, but I want to stress that what Hegel says here is that we transcend our own selves, we go beyond our own selves, not that we transcend limitations as such. Rather, it is through such limitations that the powers of self-transcendence are defined and actualized. So despite the frequent discussions of Hegel's lack of respect for all sorts of limits set by Kant's philosophy, I think Hegel, in fact, understands the power of limits in a deeper way. Rather than rendering us fixed in relation to a fixed point, natural limits render determinate powers of self-transcendence possible, but only insofar as we come to an understanding of the proper constraints of our self-determined purposes, no less of our life form and its aims. The suggestion of my talk is that an account of natural limits is not only compatible with the critical humanist account of species being that I think is definitive of Marx's critique of capitalism, but further that it develops that account in important ways that have yet to be fully appreciated. Okay, so my conclusion now. Um, I began by arguing for the importance of self-consciousness and species being as representing the methodological and normative framework for Marx's critical project, laying out some of the key features of species being as developed in Hegel and Marx. I then attempted to develop, um, defend a new way of understanding the idea of natural limits in connection with species being in a way that meets the reflexivity condition in order to assess the meaning of Marx's claim that the movement of capital is limitless or without measure. This claim is a focal point, I think, of Marx's critique of capitalism, and I argue that we can only understand the normative problem of capital's limitlessness in connection with species being. Self-consciousness of our life form is the consciousness of natural limits, where natural limits in relation to our bodies, our environments, and other human beings enable and constrain our self-defined purposes along with our powers for self-transcendence. This is the critical and normative framework that Marx deployed against the blind and measureless drive of capital untethered from all natural limits. While this might not seem like much, perhaps, <laughs> and critique cannot replace praxis, asking for anything else but our own powers of self-transformation would be for Marx an ideological fantasy, a wish that God, morality, or some other deus ex machina might come to save us after all. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I was wondering about this idea of limitlessness and, um, I mean, the, and the question whether there is a dimension inherent to life that has to be taken into account when we speak of, of limitlessness. And I, I think that relates to, uh, you know, a, a certain strand in post-Kantian thought that we seem to push aside, which is the dogmatic, or the return of the dogmatic. And uh, that comes with, uh, you know, various uh, views about nature um, that stress also that life has an inherently monistic uh, character. So that it's, it's not only, you know, that life goes beyond the individual, but stays within the realm of the species, but there is something like uh, natural, I mean, Goethe would be a good example, but I think also Schelling and others. And, and I guess the question would be, is that dimension translated somehow into human existence? And what does that mean uh, in relation to questions that bear on a you know, specific kind of suffering of life that is inflicted by uh, capitalism? So, you know, what is that infinity Exactly. What is the character? I think you could call it, you know, infinite is also a certain kind of eternal recurrence in human life. Um, so the, I think, again, this is a conception of life 
and we can trace back to ancient philosophy, but not quite Aristotelian one. Yeah, so. so. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Um, so I think what you're, if I'm understanding your question correctly, what you're pointing to is that the way that the, so you mentioned Goethe and Schelling, but I think, I think Hegel's account is very influenced by, by Goethe and Schelling, that I, I emphasized the limited nature of, I talked about natural limits and that what a life, what a, what a life form, the, the idea of a life form or species concept provides is a set of limits. And you're drawing on this idea that there's also this other strand that there's a limitlessness to the way that they conceive of life itself. And I think you're right. One of the puzzles is that I think the structure of life um, the structure of living activity and processes in this tradition. I'm going to speak broadly. I'll say in this tradition, but we could, you know, get more fine grained in, in in the break. Um, is life is characterized both in terms of uh, good, in, the true infinite, and as bad infinity. And and the passages that I quoted at the end on Hegel on the limit basically leads up to discussion on good and bad infinity. And so this is a. I think you're absolutely right. There's a puzzle. So. On the one hand, I think Hegel does suggest that something about the form of inner purposiveness of the living thing manifests a form of true infinity. It's the, fir the first and immediate form of true infinity that we get uh, in nature. On the other hand, when he speaks of life in comparison to self-consciousness, I think that's when life takes on this character of the bad infinite, right? Because it's just sort of goes on and on and on, die, live, die, live, die, live, live, reproduce, die, live, reproduce, die. And it, that is, for Hegel, a, a, a sense of limitlessness. Um, and so I think you're right to pick up on that. Um, one thing I would say is that there is, so maybe I would just say, I have to think more about this, but I would say the bad infinite character of life only shows up when we're thinking of life, mere life in connection with self-conscious life, um, it becomes a point of contrast, I would say. Um, at least I think that's how I would read it, um, that we, we, all, we all of a sudden think of life as a form of bad infinity only when we not, are now trying to draw the distinction to self-consciousness. Um, I think that, oof, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm losing my way here. I, I'm hoping that that doesn't fully challenge my account in the sense that um, the limitlessness of capital is still a different, it is a kind of bad infinity, but I think it's a, it's even a worse kind of bad infinity than mere life, in part because it's merely quantitative. We can't talk about qualities and determinate aims and purposes at all. And so, but what you're helping me see is that there are you know different levels of limitlessness that, that we could talk, even more levels of limitlessness that we could talk about that would be helpful here. Um, I have already 11 people on my list, uh, so I really ask you to limit yourself, so to speak, to only one question. Next question here from Carlyle. Uh, this is on. Okay, I'm slowly losing my voice. Sorry, but um, I um, I want I want to ask you to um, say something about how this might factor into questions of justification. So um, the reason why is uh, you know as I listen to your talk. I was put in mind of Trotsky's Their Morals and Ours, and there's this discussion of means and ends where he's addressing the, um, the, the charge that Marxism is sort of just pure Machiavellian calculation and, he sa and that the means justify the ends, and Trotsky retorts, of course, the, sorry, that the ends justify the means, and Trotsky retorts that, of course, the ends justify the means, um, but it turns out that communism is the sort of end that puts uh, definite um, particular uh, boundaries, right, on exactly the only means that are justified are the ones that would actually lead you to communism, and it turns out not just any means, right, will lead you there. Um, and he mentions things like, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of <clears throat> um, demeaning people and uh, degrading their ability to reason and to think freely for themselves, right? None of those things would lead you to communism. So I was, I want you, you like, there's so much that you say that um, is useful for that line of thought. And I, so I want to hear how you would connect this to thoughts about justification of, of particular means. That's a great question. It's a hard question. 
I think it's a great example. I mean, I, I, you, you point out exactly this point, right? That the ends, you need an end to set limits with respect to means. Um, once we have an end in view, there is limited, it, it, it's, it's probably still like, it, they're plural, but it's not an infinite number of means that we could draw on in order to achieve some particular end. So that could, I did not get into the, this idea of, right, this, that we, we say all the time, the ends justify the means. Um, I sort of stuck with very, uh, I guess, abstract philosophical questions. I do think that this, this could be one route to thinking about what kinds of means are justified if our aim is to bring about the end of communism. Um, and it does challenge, I mean, I think this came up in the discussion yesterday that you know, um, whether there's a moral approach to socialism and whether or not that can be fully consistent because it could be the case that if we have this very determinate aim in view, namely communism, um, certain means have to be employed and that could actually undermine certain moral um, considerations that we have in view. So I don't want to like take a clear stance on that <laughs> and I don't think I do in my paper, but I, I think I just agree with you that this would be the logic with which we need to think about that question, which at least challenges the possibility of something like a purely moral approach to socialism. Next, Thomas Kurana and then the next side. Uh, okay, thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, so I have two questions, one on the reflexivity condition and one on the uh, on self-consciousness as uh, species consciousness. Um, on the reflexivity condition, so I was wondering whether you think that, in a certain sense, applying that reflexivity conditions favors compatibilism. So we need to give an account of a nature where there's a place for freedom. And I'm asking this because I could see, in a certain sense, certain other approaches um, um, think that they that they can fulfill the reflexivity condition, but still have kind of an incompatibilist picture. So think about someone like Mia Su. He thinks that he needs to give an account of uh, nature where it belongs to nature that it can change its laws or, or at any minute without without any reason, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are there are catastrophic breaks in the in the order of things where something new emerges, life, and then something new emerges, spirit, and so there are breaks. So so does it need to be the case that reflexivity has to be understood in such a way that we get a compatibilistic picture? Or could there not be radical breaks? But if there could be radical breaks, then you just present it as one way of fulfilling the condition, not, not, not every possible way. Um, so just, yeah, whether you, yeah, so that's the first thing. The second thing, so you were trying to get us into the whole idea on the framework of thinking about uh, self-consciousness as species consciousness by saying, well, if it's the consciousness of an individual, an individual cannot be a this, it's a this such, so it belongs to a species. But now I'm wondering whether whether that really uh, suffices in order to get us to species consciousness in Hegel's terms and also Marx's terms, namely if that's if that's the relation that we're thinking about, then I have I have a kind of a type token kind of situation. So I have to conceive whatever I, I am or, or or see in the world or in myself as a token of a larger type. So I, I subsume it under a, a universal species right concept. But the kind of species concept that he was describing, if it's an I, that is a we, and a we, that is an I, and also the species concept, or species being in Marx, involves a second person relation to another instantiation of that species. So it's not just the type token situation, but a second person relation. So that's a different, so the sociality is not really captured by the type token thing. All right. Great. Um, I think I, I I want to affirm, so the first question about the reflexivity condition and compatibilism, I think you're right. Kant is someone who I think subscribes to the reflexivity condition and clearly has an incompatibilist picture. So I was sketching a version of it that requires compatibilism in part because I just thought that Marx, you know, that the lines that we all, these famous lines that were brought up yesterday, humanism and naturalism, naturalism and humanism. So I wanted to make Marx continuous with this, so it, the, I think his method, so the method of critique, um, and, and it's my way of resisting, you could say, the, um, the, the, the epistemological break kind of views, where if I can show that there is still this continuity here with respect to the reflexivity condition, but the reflexivity condition can be turned in, can be um, compatibilist as opposed to incompatibilist, um, which is actually how he 
clearly departs from a, a Kantian way of understanding the problem. Um, then I could you know, keep my claim that this still matters once we get to the later work where he's talking about self, he doesn't talk about species being, but it's all about self-conscious labor power. So to me, that's, that's sufficient. Um, so that would be what I would say about the reflexivity condition, but I think you're right. It doesn't, it doesn't have to entail um, naturalism. But if we, so right, right, one further point, but if we think of nature as being, a, if we're interested in thinking about nature as a condition and that these conditions of, of, of knowing an agency are not just transcendental conditions, that would be another shift. Once we want to think about uh, conditions of knowing an agency as concrete, natural, material things, then I also think we need to move in a compatible, reflexivity condition and compatibilism. <laughs> Okay, uh, self-consciousness and species consciousness, I think you're also just right. There's just a lot of things that, a lot more I need to say. Um, I think that the, I use the this such point because it was the fir easiest point, easiest way to get in, right? It's almost like Hegel, we're, I'm using a very, at least if you're Hegelian, this is like a pretty widely, like non-controversial claim, this is this such, that's like the most, you read sense certainty, this is this such. <laughs> and then we apply that, right? If we accept that, then we have to apply that to this account of ourselves. But I think you're absolutely right that it's actually a much more complicated, um, that in order to, the way that Hegel gets at that is never, you couldn't just think your way into it first personally, but you have to engage in the second, per, right, in processes of recognition, which I think is the case for him even even in not so even in mere life he's talking about the gattungs process the gattungs process is all about we could say proto second personal right these relations between the same spe relations of beings who participate in the same gattungs process um so i think you're right maybe one thing that i didn't say here that i do want to say would want to say in terms of this species consciousness point is that I need to hang, I need to say two things about it at once. On the one hand, I do want that Kantian stuff about, you know, the I think that accompanies all my representation. I want that Kantian piece of it, but saying it's species, right, the I think that includes species consciousness that accompanies all my representations. That's the sort of presuppositional side. But I also need the other side, the more hegel Marx side, which is that species consciousness is also something that's clearly achieved. It's not just, it's, it's the, sort of both presupposed and something that we need to achieve, but that this is exactly the problem that they try to explain and develop. Um, and I didn't really get at that presuppositional and achieve, that double structure, that species consciousness has to be both something presupposed at that abstract, because I'm, I'm enough of an idealist that I want to take on some of that Kantian um, stuff and then, but we also need a story about, okay, so then what, how does that presupposition structure also become developed in terms of that, that species consciousness is clearly something that also needs to be achieved historically for Hegel and Marx. Then we have a question in the back. And as we will run out of time, I think I would start clustering if you're fine with that, yeah? Is that okay? So we would have the next two questions and then um, it's your turn. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I really like the way that you describe the limitlessness of um, the capital. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that you said that capital is irrational, that it's not like the Frankfurt School could be understood instrumental reason or something like this, but that is complete irrationality. And I was wondering then, in the passage that you interpreted, um, Marx then a few sentences later, introduces the uh, the term subject, mm -hmm. and he describes value as the self-moving subject in a quasi-Hegelian way, uh, self-moving, self-mediating, self-producing subject. And now I was wondering if you say that the movement of capital is complete irrationality, and we have Hegel's concept of the subject to describe this irrationality, then, then what happens to to subjectivity in your account, uh, maybe in contrast to self-conscious living? Should I, can, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Karen. That was, that was awesome. I wanted to um, sound a note of disquiet, and I think we could dispel it. Uh, like, so, um, uh, particularly the idea of using Aristotle's discussion from the politics to illuminate the 
some of what Marx is worried about in, in Capital. Partly the kind of vague feeling I have is that Aristotle is in part trying to uh, describe what, I, what for him would be a good way for aristocratic rule <laughs> and what kind of that. <clears throat> can, it, can you hear now? Yes, yeah. Uh, Aristotle, it seems to me, is partly worried about the kind of virtues an aristocratic ruling class should have, and that they need a certain kind of temperance in order to distinguish themselves from the hoi polloi. Um, so that seems to me partly what Aristotle is concerned with in describing in the opening bits of the politics. So that's why I'm a bit um, concerned that we would use that to illuminate what Marx is worried about in Capital. That's my disquiet, and I'm just put it out there in the hopes that maybe you can disquiet it for me. Yeah. So I think, well, first of all, it, I turn. I, I, I would say I turn. I, I, I turn to Aristotle's politics because it's such a long footnote. <laughs> there, are that, that book has a lot of footnotes, but um, I, I took the length of the footnote to be signaling something important. But your point about virtue, I think I might want to just say I, that that to me is not a worry, but maybe a good thing because I think you could say. There is, except in Aristotle, right, so we're no longer, Aristotle's way of understanding the ruling class of the hoi polloi is clearly not the same class structure that we have or that Marx is thinking about. Um, but in that case, he is suggesting that there is something about, so the implication would be that the limitlessness of capital as an organizing principle of our form of life um, makes us completely... Um, vicious, right? It, it gives us vice. It, it's a, it's a, it makes, it, it produces vice um, among the people who participate in this form of life. And I think I would just bite that bullet and, and agree with that. Um, and that we would need to call. So then the other, the, the next st inference would be we need to cultivate other virtues in order to appreciate what it is to be self-transcending beings in relation to limits, as opposed to. The, the vices that we cultivate when the organizing principle of our form of life is all about this limitlessness um, um, without any kind of moss in the sense that uh, Marx tries to identify. So I think I would turn that worry into a, oh good, there's more resources there <laughs> that, that um, more, more ways of developing what Marx is saying. So capital is subject. I think I have to, re you're, you're right about the, I made that point very quickly. I think it's an intuition that I have that I, I realized, oh, it isn't just this, this is actually like, it, it, it is not even, it falls below the level of a, a proper, a, a form of instrumental reason proper is what I am pulling as the argument here. Um, and one thing that I think I have to say then, all those passages where he says the cap, not just capital is subject, he talks about, he uses all of the terms of capital as a Zelpsvek. So all the terms that we normally want to apply to us, <laughs> he's applying, like that's the inversion account. He's applying to capital. And then I think I would have to say that it's, it's mere appearance. Um, it has to be the mere appearance of an, a, a, a Zelpsvek, the mere appearance of a subject. Capital can't really, and, and that's actually important for the reflexivity condition. Capital can't really be a self-moving subject um, because if it was a completely self-moving subject, we, then we, then we truly would no longer be able to act on it as a condition that we ourselves created. Um, and so that's why I think I have to take, the, in, the interpretation has to be that all of this language is, is a way of signaling us to, of course, to the inversion that's taken place, but that this inversion has to be a mere appearance because if the inversion is not mere appearance, then there is no way for us to self-consciously act on those conditions so as to change them. And I take it that that has to be a possibility. And then on my left. Yeah. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for the very lucid and uh, thought-provoking talk. Uh, um, I wanted to ask something. I hope it doesn't just uh, reiterate what has been asked before. But, uh, it's also on the subject. Um, and I found it very interesting to think about not only instrumental reason, 
because you've distances, uh, distanced your approach from that, but instrumental subjectivity in a sense. And I, I was thinking of uh, in Dialectics of Enlightenment, Adorno and Hockham, I seem to have something like that in mind when they not just talk about uh, instrumental reason, but like the modern subject as the male instrumental and so on subject. And now I think my question is, because you were talking so much about the subject, um, there seem to be so many subjects on so many scales. Like we have the individual as a subject in a way we have social groups as subjects, maybe social classes, and we have sort of humanity as a subject, and then we only have also have capital as a subject. And now the question is, how do all these subjects relate? And does this kind of other subjectivity that seems to be necessary, this other way of relating subject and object, uh, can we have like a general model for all of these or, yeah, maybe you can help me with it. Thank you. Hello. I, I was wondering about the connection between the, the early Marx and then the Marx and Capital when it comes to the species being. Because in Capital, there are some ways uh, in which he seems to... Uh, not use some theses he has in like the economy philosophical manuscripts for example he it talks about labor more so uh, as a form of assimilation or a part of the assimilation process like you pointed out in your powerpoint and he says for example that you will never if you eat grain <laughs> or something you will never recognize another person in that grain. You will never see it as an actualization uh, of their individual being. So there is a cut there where the socialization is, is for Marx, not only in capital, but on principle, not a, a species process. So um, this is when he talks about the, um, uh, the labor process in general. And... Um, also, if you look at your uh, at the um, quote you have with the um, irreparable rift, for example, um, actually the word li life or condition of living processes is not from Marx but from Engels when he um, uh, edited it. So, in Marx's version, he just talks about the fert fertility of the soil and then the uh, social metabolism. So it wouldn't actually like there wouldn't be a clear connection to me to the early manuscripts and of perceiving metabolism in connection with uh, Gattung's process. My, uh, where does the connection, I think, come from? I don't really see the sociality. And in, in the, also it's, I don't, it's not about the Gattung's uh, species process of the human being, but of the soil. And, in connection to that, the uh, individual assimilation process of people. So I do think that, I think that there's, there's other textual evidence, but I think the, that account of the labor process, to me, I read that as completely about a form of self-conscious human labor. And he talks in species-specific terms, right? He can, it's us and the bees. The bees do it this way, we do it this way. There's also a great footnote um, in Capital One where he criticizes the utilitarians for using the principle of usefulness in a non-species specific way. One of the things he says is that usefulness is fine, right? Like, you, obviously we need to talk about utility, but utility doesn't mean any, utility for what? Utility for dogs, utility for, right? <laughs> so it's clear that his entire philosophical orientation Pull, takes that from the early marks that he takes from this tradition, it, it doesn't make any sense to, t so there is a general form of the labor, so metabolism is something, the metabolic interaction is something that applies to all living things, but that's very, we could say that, and it's true. <laughs> I don't think it's just trivial, but it's, it's sure, it's true, but in every case, me metabolic processes are, look different depending on the species. The labor process looks a certain way because we are a certain kind of because we are self our metabolic processes are self conscious are always self consciously appropriated. So to me, that's completely pre even though he doesn't use the term. To me, the idea is exact the philosophical conception at play there when he's talking about the labor process 
that is the, the key to the critique of political economy when we get to that chapter, I think is, I, I would just defend that and say it, I think it is the same. Um, so the sub, just different social groups and different senses of subjectivity, that, that's a very difficult question. Um, I don't think I want to say, so one thing that isn't here, even though I talk so much about consciousness and self-consciousness, obviously the, 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 the thing I didn't say anything about was class consciousness. <laughs> so groups, how, so self-consciousness is not just an individual, it's, it's these second personal relations as Thomas mentioned, but also really what we need to get to are um, groups of people with common interests acting together. Um, and I didn't say I didn't say anything about that. Um, you you connected it with this question of instrumental reason. I mean, I do think that a barrier or a potential blockage to and this is something I think that the Frank, the early Frankfurt School is obviously very attuned to. Like, what are the reasons that something like class consciousness didn't didn't develop as a subject such that they could act? And, and transform their conditions. Um, clearly, what you pointed out, right? These forms of instrumental reason. I didn't. I, it wasn't a critic. I should be clear. I don't want to critic. I think the account is of, of the critique of instrumental reason is largely correct. But maybe we could just Marx maybe could even take it deeper to show that the, the irrationality is even deeper. Not just that we're only employing this narrow conception of reason, but that even in this narrow conception of reason, we're not quite doing it properly. Um, so yeah, I think that's just a very, that, that would be the next question. How do we move from this idea of self-consciousness and species consciousness and how does it, how might it help us think about the group at the group level and specifically something like class consciousness? We're going to take two more in and then with that, I think we will leave it. Okay. Um, thanks so much, Karen. I, I love the paper. Um, I guess that my question was, you know, you said something about this tension or this idea that species consciousness is both presupposed and achieved. And I was curious to know, to hear a bit more about the, the role of history in this. Like, do you, do you think, like, is, is the claim that history is simply what kind of you know, the framework through which, or the necessary framework that allows us to achieve this presupposed species uh, consciousness, or is species consciousness itself kind of in, in, in relevant ways shaped by history, or are or, or, or the natural limits in, 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 in relevant ways shaped by history? Because you were saying that for Hegel, these limits are not inherent and fixed, and so from there, I kind of got the idea, oh, so they must be in a certain way shaped by different historical considerations. And if that's the case, what's, uh, what's the picture that we get? Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, my question is also regarding the question of history. Um, I can broadly appreciate um, how species being can be helpful in understanding like a gaining a methodological orientation or normative kind of grounding in capital. But I'm struggling to see how we can reconcile this kind of orientation with the fundamentally historically determinate and socially reflexive kind of nature of Marx's methodological kind of gesture in his mature critique of political economy in the sense that um, his question or his critique contra the classical political economists is how does this content assume this form? Why does labor assume this specifically historically determinate, socially kind of particular kind of form? And then my question would be, why is then, or how is capital then limitless? Um, how does this kind of social content, how does the social activity assume this historically determinate form in which then acquires this kind of limitless kind of quantitative quality. Um, and then if capital is then a social relation, is it also not also is it not also always 
a perverted or inverted form of speech is activity, um, can we kind of capture kind of capital as a form of speech is activity in that sense? Um, and then draw like a, uh, like a line from species being in the early philosophical manuscripts to capital. Thanks. So you're right. There's so in the text, he does talk about how there's a general form that takes. So there's a general form of the labor process that takes historically specific shapes. So clearly, I think I would have to say that the gen when I said in answer to this this previous question that also had this concern about whether or not the the, the concept of labor and capital really is continuous with this earlier approach of self-conscious species being, I think I would try to show that it's continuous with what Marx says is the general form. And then, of course, there's this general form of self-conscious, let's say, metabolism, and then this takes specific shape in, in, in every historical formation. Um, but you're right that um, it would be interesting to think about how this general form relates to the very specific historical form that we see in 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 our um, mode of production. Um, so I, I I hope that helps. But I I, I agree with you that it would be important to make that distinction. Um, in terms of Danielle's question, um, so I mean both of you also asked about history. Um, one answer one answer is Vanessa's <laughs> paper. I think this idea of dialectical compatibilism is, is, is really helpful. But I, I like what you said that, that so it's, I totally agree with you that these limits are going to be shaped by history. Um, and you could think about the current way in which natural limits, I mean, so it's not an accident that I, I got interested in thinking about natural limits now. <laughs> um, and it almost seems as if due to historical conditions, we are now right thinking about what even instrumentally rational ways of acting would be in light of the the, the limits and problems that we face. Um, the natural limits that we have ignored and that now take a particular form in in the, in trying to deal with something like the climate crisis is clearly something that's also historically specific. And I think that's what I do. I, I do need. I talk too, probably too much about Aristotle and not enough about Hegel, and I think maybe Hegel would be more helpful for showing us why this is dynamic and something that is continually shaped by history, but no less a natural limit for that. Beautiful last remark, I'd say. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm I beg your pardon that I could not call for all the questions in the room, but uh, lunchtime is precious, and um, we're going to have about 60 minutes for lunchtime before we pursue our conversation with the next talk by Thomas. And um, please join me in thanking Karen for this lucid, wonderful talk, and then. <laughs> Thank you.